yourself tonight. Hold this joy in your waters. Let your river rush in over my soul. I'm free, I'm pleased, I'm made.
Lord, there's joy in your water here tonight. Lord, let your river rush through this place and rush through us, Lord, like a mighty, 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 mighty rushing wind through this place tonight, Lord. Oh, Holy Spirit. So open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Sing, open the eyes. So open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Yes, I do, Lord. So open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy, holy You are high and lifted up Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power.
light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy, holy You are high and lifted up Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy, holy We sing holy, holy, holy Holy, holy, holy Holy, holy, holy Lord, I want to see you We sing holy, holy, holy Holy, holy, holy Holy, holy, holy holy. I want to see Sing holy, 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 I want to see you, Lord, I want to see you, I want to see you, I want to see you, Lord, I want to see you. I want to see you, Lord, I want to see you, I want to see you, nobody is beautiful, I want to see you, nobody is lovely, I want to see you, nobody is wonderful, I want to see you. Eternal King, you 
wanna step out on the waters. I don't wanna stay in my safe place when you're calling me higher. I don't wanna be comfortable. I wanna step out on the waters. I don't wanna stay in the safe place when you're calling me higher. Cause when I am uncomfortable, you are my comforter. And when I am uncomfortable, you are my comforter. In everything I need, you provide for me, you provide for me. Everything I need, you provide for me. And I never want to go back to my old life. I never want to go back to yesterday. I never want to go back to my old life. I need you more. Oh, I need you Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the says the Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him. to 
trust you more. Lord, give me grace yes. to trust you more. To say, Lord, give me grace to trust you
no turning back. It's not a mistake that Christina and Josh picked out these songs because there's a lot of things I've been dealing with personally. A lot of things I've been dealing with personally. And I just want you guys to just listen to the Lord as I kind of share my testimony of what's been going on here in the past couple of weeks. And I pray that the Holy Spirit just speaks to you about your tithes, your offerings, and your alms, how important they are. Dr. Russ talked about that a little bit when he was closing this morning, if you were here, if you're watching on live stream. Welcome everybody from Eagle Worldwide. How y'all doing on live stream? I wish I could see y'all's faces, but I'm sure y'all are smiling. For, for me, um, I've been struggling super hard with fear. And me and my wife decided that 2019, there's no more fear. We're done with fear. We're done living in fear. We're tired of fear. Fear and I didn't realize this as a man of my household and even as a believer, but I didn't realize when I first got married, fear overtook me, like fear of losing her, fear of not providing enough, fear of what is to come. But this year, we drew a line in the sand together and we said, fear, you have no place in our lives, in our household. So we're dreaming big, we're going after God, we're going after things that, are, that seem ridiculous to go for right now in, in our state. We're, we're actually, we're actually uh, trying to actually buy a house, but we don't have the funds to buy a house. Are you hearing me? But fear says, oh, no, 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 you gotta do this, you gotta do this, you gotta do this. And then maybe by the time you, you might be ready to buy a house. But God says, hey, I own a cattle on a thousand hills. Becky helped me remind me of that word this afternoon at lunch. Thank you, ma'am. And with that step of faith of, because we've been going to open houses. Christina showed us one not too long, long ago. And we we're like, yes, Lord, this is it. And it was way out of our budget. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter anymore. Because once again, the perspective has shifted. And we have, I'm sure it's up, no it's not, I guess we lost it, uh, but we have a text to give, if you guys can throw that up. Even if you feel like the Lord, oh Lord, I wanna give this, but I don't have the cash, it's okay, we got, we got away, we got away. Text to give, it's a beautiful thing. Whatever the Lord has impressed on your heart to give tonight, because this ministry is worth sowing into. And this ministry is worth pouring into and pouring out of. This ministry is worth going all the way for. Because we've decided as a body and as, a, as believers that there's no turning back. There's no other world. There's no other way. There's nothing left but Jesus. There's no one else but Jesus. When Peter got out of the boat, I'm sure there was fear in front of him saying, it's impossible. But he remembered with God, all things, all, all things are possible. And so we just take that and we are running with it. And it doesn't make any sense. Like the Lord, the Lord impressed me to, to, to like out of nowhere, um, Dr. Russ, opened up a couple of guys to come to New Jersey with him. And he's like, pray about it, just pray about it. And I'm like, nah, that ain't for me, God. I was like, that'd be cool to go to Jersey, cool to go to Philly with him, but nah. Because it's Mother's Day weekend, I wanna spend time with my mom. And the Lord knew that, and he was like, you need to go. And I'm like, but Lord, I have no funds. I have no money. And he's like, you need to go. And so I got a hold of Amos and, uh, and uh, Robin, and I'm like, so, how much are tickets? And they told us, I was like, okay, Lord, and bought my ticket. <laughs> Man, it's better living obedience than sacrifice. Saul lost a kingdom over that. And you can read that in 1 Samuel. But anyway, 
So if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're ready to say, if you're ready to say in your life, you know what, I'm done with fear too. If this encouraged you, because that's, that's the point, for fear to be like, you have no more room in my life. There's no more room. There's no more opportunity for you to speak in my life. God speaking in my life. And he said, all things, I can do whatever, I can do whatever he's called me to. So with that, put it on the back. We believe it that you, you just put, put what you're believing for on the back of your envelope, your family, your friends, a new house, Jesus, uh, a new car. I mean, whatever you're believing for, whatever you're asking God for, and you're like, you know what, Lord, I'm laying this down, and I think you're just going to take care of it. Because I'm a living testimony that in, in the realm right now that I'm in, I, there should be no way I'm doing the things I'm doing, but the Lord is opening doors just because of faith. Faith will take you further than you, you ever would believe. So I got the, okay, cool. We got the baskets up, sweet. Uh, so if you guys are ready to say, fear, I'm done with you. Baskets are up here. Just have a seat of faith, man. It's just a mustard seed, just a mustard seed. So come on. Come on and give your alms. Come on, give your offerings. Come on, give your tithe. Give, give whatever you feel like the Lord has given to give you or to, to press to give you. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. If you can, just give him a wave offering. Just start thanking him. Just start thanking him now for what he's been doing in your life. He's done so much in our life. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Woo! your hands towards the offering, towards your alms, towards your, towards your blessing. Father, we just say thank you and that we know this is going to be sown on good ground. And fear, I speak to you now and I say no more. No more, no more, no more, no more, no more, no more. In Jesus' name, we thank you, God, for faith to arise. We thank you, God, for you just to pour into us more and more and for our faith to just go out and do more and more, God, to where we can give to people, to where we can be a blessing, be a blessing to bless others, Lord. And we thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. Jesus, we just seal this in your, in your precious, precious name. And we thank you. And we pray that this is lifted up like a sweet fragrance in your nose. In your holy, precious name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Good evening, good evening. How is everyone doing this evening? Awesome. One more time, how's everybody doing? Okay, all right. I just didn't know. I didn't know if y'all are alive or not. I just want to make sure. Um, uh, okay, so I just have two announcements, okay, uh, that we're going to mention tonight. The first one is Solutions Boot Camp. Several people have signed up from our, um, our Sunday night crowd, okay, our Eagle Worldwide family. Um, if y'all uh, have signed up, please come right over here after service. We're going to make sure you have a little card that you need to fill out, and we're going to give you a book um, because I don't know how long it's been since you took a class, but typically you get your book ahead of time because the teacher likes to like slip that syllabus into you and give you like a pile of homework before the first day. Um, so that's what Mama Hug did. No, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. But you do have a chapter to read <laughs> and a little paper to fill out. So if you signed up for Solutions, we're really excited about it. It's going to be every Wednesday night in May. And um, again, right here after service, it takes like five minutes. We'll give you a piece of paper. It's like a quarter of a sheet of paper. And then... Um, it's also got a book for you. Uh, the second announcement that I have is um, May 5th. Everybody say May 5th. May 5th. That's next Sunday. So everybody say next Sunday night. All right, what we're going to do is service is going to be a little bit different. So for our Sunday night crowd who always comes in, there won't be these chairs. Okay, we're going to have tables set up. And what we're doing is a May We Bless You night. We're still having a service. We're still going to have... Um, an encouraging word and a little bit of worship. And what we're going to do is we're blessing the teachers of our preschool, okay? Uh, they, they come in here in and out every day, all day, um, from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And so we're just doing a little something to bless them. 
With that being said, we are also going to have food. Everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Yeah, so next Sunday night for our Sunday night crowd, you get to partake of food. The only thing I ask of you is that you sign up in the back. Because how many of y'all have ever been to a party and the food ran out? It's not much of a party, right, when you're the person that doesn't get to eat, right? So it's not a lot of fun. So what we're asking is for you to go in the back, sign up, just saying you're coming. You don't got to bring anything. If you would like to bring something, we're asking you to bring a dessert because everyone loves sugar, and this is the South. And um, if you don't want to bring a dessert, you don't have to. You can just show up. But we're going to have an awesome night. We're going to bless those ladies. We're going to bless the family. We're basically just going to have a time of, like, true fellowship. You know, we're going to hear a little bit of the word, and then we're going to get to know and hang out with a lot of people, and it's going to be a lot of fun, and it really is going to be a blessing to these uh, teachers. Um, we're just really trying to show them, make some connection, and let them know that we love them, that we appreciate them. And sometimes, you know, you just need to know someone's praying for you. And so that's really what we want to do. We just want to show them some love and let them know that there's a group of people out there that's praying for them throughout the week. So when that kid is screaming and they feel like pulling out their hair, they don't have to because there's somebody there who's got the angels dispatching them their way. All right. Amen. All right. So I have no other announcements. So without any further ado, we got Dr. Russ coming up here tonight to bring us the word. Wonderful. Yes. Glory to God. I just love it. our worship team. Is, let's give the worship team a great big hand. It is really wonderful. What a great blessing they are to bring us into the presence of the Lord. And, you know, sometimes that mixture of the old and the new just strikes our hearts in a special way. It's just beautiful to see. And, and I'm really, I'm really excited to hear about the next gen group. You know, that next generation, that generation that's really hungry and on fire, that's coming up, and it, it's so good to see them worship, but then it's also good to see them serve so many ways. The way that they've, they've been is just beautiful. And uh, James mentioned when he was up about, uh, about us going out, uh, we just went to Jacksonville recently, a couple of us. Now, I'm going to bring three guys with me to... Uh, to Vineland, New Jersey, about an hour and a half from Atlantic City. I've been going there to a big assembly church since 1999, I guess. Been a long while. We're going to have Dr. Rob with me and uh, Amos and James. And anytime we travel, we try to travel as a team and uh, walk together, work together. So keep us in your prayers. That's going to be Mother's Day weekend. Pastor Maeve will be here on Mother's Day morning. But on Mother's Day night, we won't have a Sunday night in our uh, glory encounter. We'll just spend that with your mamas and uh, with your children, so you just enjoy that. But we'll be up there that weekend in Vineland, New Jersey, just across the river from Philadelphia. And uh, we're looking forward to having a wonderful time. The next Sunday, we're going to have a morning and an evening service, so we're going to have us a, a beautiful time. Pastor Maeve and I, in the middle of the week for a couple of days, will be headed up to Ottawa, and uh, we'll be there for uh, a conference of the MPs, which are House of Representatives, and uh, the House of Representatives and the Senators from the country will be in Ottawa. That's the capital, like, like our Washington, D.C., in case you're not familiar with it. You know, that's my mission field. This is my home, and I love Canada, and I love what God's trying to do in the church in Canada right now. So we'll be with them now. Uh, the apostolic community is going to be meeting with these with these politicians, and we're going to be in a roundtable setting with them and some other ways to really have an impact on, on what's going on in the nation. And the next day will be the Canadian Coalition of Apostolic Leaders will be meeting together. And the following day we'll be on a round table, just uh, 12 or 13 of us. We'll be with a man by the name of uh, Shearer. He is the head of the Conservative Party for the nation of Canada. And we're gonna have a private time with him and a round table to talk about the issues of you know the church's issues and our heart uh, for the nation of Canada and for the political system there. So please keep us in prayer next week. We'll only be there a couple of days, and then we'll be right back and and we we'll see what God's God's going to do. But you know, every time we go out, 
Uh, you know, you go with us. You know, you go in prayer. Sometimes you travel as part of the team. It's just, it's wonderful to work and serve together. It's just great to be a part of what God's doing in this generation. Uh, last week, or the last time I was here, I talked a little bit about the uh, about what real prophets do, because I'm talking right now about the apostles and prophets walking and working together. It's the restoration, the season of the restoration of fivefold ministry. We don't have a problem with, um, you know, with teachers and evangelists and pastors, but we haven't done a very good job in the restoration of the apostolic and prophetic ministries. And uh, it's time for that to happen. The last 15 or 20 years, we've heard the prophetic words over and over. We've heard the preachers preach about Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Uh, you know, he gave us apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and pastors. And each one of them are an expression of the ministry life of Christ while he was in the earth. It doesn't make any one of those five-fold leaders any better than anyone else. We're just all the same. We just each bring something different to the table, a different aspect of ministry. And there's a different mantle uh, that's on each one. And he said, if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, then you receive the prophet's reward. So. That tells me that I have to know what a prophet looks like, what a prophet does, how they are. So that like, how can I receive them if I don't know what they are, if I don't know what they do, if I don't have an understanding of them? And sometimes we'll talk about this new wineskin, and we know that it's God, and we know that it's God in our generation. We know that he's trying to change the church, but what's it really going to look like? You know, what do they do? How do I recognize you? You know, because you, know, you, you can't expect me to come up here and look like John the Baptist just because I happen to be a prophetic voice in this generation. So you have to be able to recognize him. And he says, know a tree by the fruit it bears. So as I talked about the prophetic last week, and each one of us have some different aspect of the fivefold that's in us and that we're in alignment with some way in the whole body. Yeah, because... Pastor Maven and I believe in the priesthood of the believer. We believe that the moment you said yes to Jesus, God birthed the ministry in you, that you are anointed, that you are called, that there's a mandate that's on your life. There's a destiny plan that God had from the very beginning of time. You were born with a natural DNA, and when you were reborn in the spirit, you were born with a spiritual DNA. There's a call on your life and you're anointed. Now, somewhere you come into alignment with different aspects of this five-fold ministry, but one's not any better than the other. We're just all supposed to walk together and, and, and bring balance to the body of Christ. If you only get one look, one person, and that's, this becomes that person's pulpit, and then, then you're only getting that one look and that one aspect of the heart of God, rather than a balanced look, right? This, the pulpit does not belong to a man, does not belong to a minister, to a priest. We're all part of a royal priesthood. The pulpit belongs to God, and we need to see the fivefold ministry through the body of Christ to hear the prophetic word. This morning I was one of the most prophetic services I've ever been in. And I've been blessed to be in some really prophetic services. I mean, I've been in some prophetic services where me and the team prophesy over two, three hundred people, right? You know, that's pretty prophetic. And, but this morning, during worship, I don't know, maybe five, six people, seven people came up and prophesied. And they prophesied exactly what we were going to do. It was like the sermon before the sermon. And it was so prophetic and so profound to the battle that, that's been raging in my heart, and I'm sure in many of your lives as well, as, as we're the tribe of Hungary, still seeking and pursuing God. But we have had so many personal experiences over the years, and some of them have left us with some negative blowback in our lives with some feelings about, well, can I really do this? Can I really do that? Should I really go after God? Yeah. 
God's promises are yea and amen. And this morning, he just, he, he just used all of these different individuals to say something extremely encouraging to us. And it was the sermon before the sermon. So we knew we heard from God this morning, encouraging us to rise up, to pursue him, to don't allow discouragement to come into our lives, don't, don't allow past experiences to, to slow us down or hinder us. We're all at a different phase, a different place in life. But let's pursue God. I mean, there's a great blessing for those that seek him. And we have a sister with us tonight, Sister Alice, who a wonderful sister, comes and visits a missionary to, in Africa. A great blessing when she comes. And we also have with us uh, Bob and Dana Corvino, who have been part and partners of the ministry for a long, long time. Just wonderful. They're from New York. They're Dr. Rob's uh, parents. Let's give them a great big hand. You know, they're... They're like family, and they're going to be here a whole lot more, and especially since, since Dr. Rob is here. You know, you know how that goes if you're a mama. So uh, it's a wonderful thing. You know, there's, I, I talked about the prophets last week, and I'll just review. There are a few things that real prophets do, and then I'm going to get to what real apostolic leaders do today so that we can begin to recognize it, so that we can receive the prophet or the apostle or the pastor in the name of who they are so that we can receive that reward that goes with it. That's that mantle, that's that anointing. We have to be able to receive them so in the name of who truly they are and then we'll receive the blessing that's on their life. Real prophets preach repentance. Not judgment, but it's the love of God that turns man to repentance. So they speak truth and they preach repentance. Uh, John the Baptist, he said, he preached the gospel to him. He said, repent ye for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus went out in Matthew 4, preach, repent ye for the kingdom of God is at hand. True prophets preach repentance, not judgment, but love, knowing that God's about to do something wonderful. Real prophets declare and stand for righteousness. In this hour, there's a lot of do-goody kind of stuff going on and crimped gospel and watered down, homogenized. Everybody's okay. Everybody's saved. All of that nonsense. You can do whatever you want. That's just not the truth. Real prophets stand for righteousness and they try to live a righteous life and you need to be able to see them for who they are and they need to stand for righteousness sake. It's really important in our generation that they declare and stand for righteousness. Real prophets build altars unto God. Before they're anything else, they're a prayer warrior, they're an intercessor. If you see a prophet who doesn't have a legitimate, powerful prayer life with God, they may have a prophetic gift, but they're not really a prophet because real prophets build altars wherever they go and whatever they do. If they're called into prophet in a marketplace, when they go to work, they'll build an altar in the marketplace. They'll begin to, to pray there. They'll build altars wherever they go. And usually, if you look back prophetically, they built altars in high places. Okay, and that was a place of battle, a place of conflict, right? A place where they confronted the enemy. But our first place in the New Testament for every one of us to build an altar is in our own heart, in our own home, in the places where we dwell, wherever our feet touch, right? He's going to give us the land, but we need to build altars a place of sacrifice, a place of prayer, a place of intercession. Before you're a prophet or any other fivefold minister, First and foremost, you need to be an intercessor. Real prophets build altars. Real prophets duplicate and multiply, raising up other prophetic voices and teaching people how to hear the voice of the Lord. Raising up not slaves and servants, but sons and daughters who learn how to hear the voice of the Lord for themselves and have a servant's heart. So you're going to find them duplicating and multiplying Real prophets prophesy, and they prophesy with accuracy and authority. They know how, when you, you'll know a prophet, when you hear that prophet, when you hear that prophetic word, there'll be some, I'm telling you, they're going to have the juice on it. And it's going to be accurate, and, it, and it's, it, it's going to be given and brought with authority. So they, 
They speak creatively. They make declarations and proclamations, not just in the church, but in the marketplace and wherever they go. They'll make bold declarations and proclamations to give God something to walk out on. How many of you know there's power in that spoken word and that power, in the, that power under the anointing of the office gift of the prophet will declare a way that God can walk on. When John the Baptist was declaring the word of the Lord, he was giving him a place to walk. He was making a light. He was pushing back the darkness and bringing forth the light by declaration and proclamation with the prophetic anointing that was on his life. So you'll know, you'll know a prophet when you meet a prophet, not by their title, nor by the attention that they draw, nor by the crowd that, they, that gathers around them, but you'll know them by the fruit that they bear. Because he said, no a tree by the fruit they bear. You don't, don't get caught up in all the hoopla of the things that are going on. It, it's not about nickels and noses. And it's not about how many people come in. It's about how many people go out. Because every one of the fivefold ministries that it, it, it talks about in Ephesians 11, in Ephesians 4, 11, he says who they are. In Ephesians 4 and 12, he says their job description. Their job description is to equip the saints so the saints can do the work of the ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. It's not how good they prophesy. It's not how good they preach. It's not how good they teach. But are they raising up sons and daughters? Are they discipling? Are they mentoring? Are they raising up leaders? That's how you'll know them. You know what? The Israelites, they were looking for a king. And obviously, they were looking for a king who was head and shoulders above everybody else. And they picked the wrong one. They picked Saul. You know, sometimes, you know, we'll look at the, the guy that has the mega church, and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that that person is not, or even that mega churches are not good. God's going to use every kind of church that would be open to allow his voice and his will to be done. So he'll use every different kind of church. But sometimes we'll pick somebody because they have a mega church and think they must be an apostle. They just may be a great administrator. They just may be a wonderful business person. You know, it, it's just... When God was looking for the real king, it was the ruddy little guy on the backside of nowhere, taking care of the sheep, learning how to fight with the weapons that father gave him. He couldn't use Saul's armor. It didn't fit him. Right? So we need to know, not by the size, because that has nothing to do with it. It's the heart of the matter and the fruit that goes with that. That's how we're going to know them, is by their fruit. Let's talk a little bit about the apostolic, because it's a very important season where the apostolic is being fully and wholly restored back into the body of Christ. And, uh, and the final part of this restoration that began in 1948 is coming to pass now. He began doing it in Israel as he restored the nation of Israel there's a parallel awakening that's occurring in the church, and he's restoring the church. Back to the foundational truths, the biblical truths of what the church is supposed to look like. And he talks about that in the book of Ephesians, which is actually the book of the emerging church. Uh, that's the church that we're supposed to be, the 21st century church coming out in power. And what they said, we're no longer strangers in, in chapter 2, but fellow citizens in the household of God, built on the foundation of apostles and prophets and the chief cornerstone being Christ himself. So foundational ministries are, are the prophet and apostle. And one of the problems that we have is that they have a little trouble walking together, right? Because they have a different perception. They have a different look, all right? Uh, you know, a, a lot of the prophetic community, and I get a chance to work for them and uh, work with them, and I love them, uh, but uh, we, we could be a little radical. You know, uh, bouncing off the walls and all kind of prophetic things going on and declarations and proclamations and uh, where the apostles are very strategic. Apostles are going to 
do very strategic things. They're going to hear from God. They're master builders. They want to see something that is real, something produced in the earth, something that's going to change the society that we live in. That's why you're hearing the messages coming of the seven mountains. That's why you're hearing everything coming again about marketplace ministry, because the apostolic that's being restored is going to bring real and lasting fruit in a very practical practical way. See, revelation is wonderful, and you, you, you can have me bouncing off the ceiling and, and goosebumps everywhere, but sooner or later, I've got to come down, I've got to put my feet on the ground, and I've got to put my hand to the plow, and I've got to do something legitimately and produce something for God with the revelation that it gives me. It has to go from revelation to mission, and mission to strategy, and strategy to action. And that's kind of the apostolic look when you, you look at the apostle. They, they want to see results. And they are going to penetrate the marketplace. You're going to see apostolic leaders in media. You're going to see apostolic leaders in government. You're going to see them representing God in a very real and a very tangible way, changing society that we live in, having a real impact. The, the, the apostles of new are the same apostles. They're apostles then and apostles now. But we have to know what they look like and know what they do and know how they perform their function so that we can receive them, so we can pray for them and, and honor them like we honor any other leader. But honor them, but we don't worship them, right? We honor men and women that pour into our life, that bring something from God for us, but we honor them, but we don't worship them. We worship God and God alone. And what we have to do, though, is to see what they have, know who they are, and receive that blessing that's on them. So if you happen to be in the marketplace, and we, an apostle comes in and they're talking about marketplace ministry and, and business and all this kind of thing, sometimes we think, well, hmm, I don't know, that don't, that don't sound like real spiritual. You know what I'm saying? So they, they all want this, this exegesis, right, of scripture and, ooh, all spiritual. But we're sitting there. You know, we're, that, that's what we're used to. We're used to the religious side of church. And God is trying to break that model and say, hold on a second. I'm not about religion. I'm about relationship. Uh, I'm not just about going to church. I'm about being the church. I'm about breaking this old mindset. I'm about opening up the doors and knocking down the walls. And I want my people to go out and have an impact. Amen? And that's what he's trying to do. Right? So that's bringing a lot of, I mean, that's bringing a lot of shaking to you and I who were raised generationally in the church because something must not have been right if he's trying to bring this must change. Knock, knock, knock. Right? He's, he's wanting to change things. So what he wants to change is me. I have to change. It's fine to be a, 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 a world changer or a history maker. And all, but before you could change there, you got to change here. I got I to gotta take ground in my own heart, and I have to be willing to change. I have to be willing to change my methods, not my message, but my methods to, to, to be spirit contemporary, to reach this generation. I can't expect to keep doing the same old thing we've been doing for 50 years and get brand new and different results. Hello? I mean, that, that, that's crazy. You know, so I, I, have to, I have to be willing to change the way I'm bringing this wonderful freedom message that God has and how he wants to change the church today. But before I could change there, I got to change here and I got to change here. Before I can change who I am, I have to change my mindset, my perception of things, and I have to be willing to change. And the leaders of this generation that hear the voice of the Lord, the apostolic community that's going to come alive is going to be apostolic and prophetic. It's going to be along the lines of the sons of Ezekiel. They're going to know what it was that Israel was supposed to do, and they're going to lead them in doing. Right? But they're going to have to change. I'm going to have to change. You're going to have to change. He's trying to change us. From the moment he touched us, he begins a process of changing us and changing our mind so that we can manifest the perfect will of God in the earth. Not to conform to this world, it says in Romans chapter 12, or something, but what? Change me. Transform me. So that I can bring actually 
legitimate change to society around me. What are these apostles then and apostles now? You know, wh what do they look like? I, I think I got this machine. I'm gonna see if I can figure it out. These guys got me covered here pretty good, I'm sure, if I can figure it out. Uh, what am I got now? I got nothing yet. Huh? I'm probably looking for Michael to help me. <laughs> huh? There we go. Do I tap that? Maybe I got it on the wrong spot. No, it should be working. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it's not. Yeah, we're, huh? we're getting there. That's one. That's another. How about that? There we go. It's one off. Now it's gone. It's one off. Just tap the one below the one you Just want. Just tap the next one. Yeah. You know, when you look at apostles now, Jesus came preaching the kingdom. But Paul was sent to us apostolically to teach us how to build church and how to manifest and extend and advance the kingdom of God in the book of Ephesians. He's not looking for the first century church. He's looking for the 21st century church. Now, those apostles then and now, therefore, no longer strangers. Like I talked about in Ephesians chapter 2. I talked to you about fivefold ministry in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. What is an apostle, legitimately. I don't know how to tap this thing right. It ain't working, huh? Am I changing? Give me the slide number five, if you would, Michael, and then we'll just do it that way, huh? Give me the slide five. C. Peter Wagner gave probably one of the greatest descriptions of what an apostle is. He was a great theologian. Dallas Theological Seminary. In fact, him and John Kelly are the ones that commissioned me back then, but he, he's with the Lord now. He defines an apostle as a Christian leader who's gifted, taught and commissioned by God with the authority to establish the foundational government of the church within an assigned sphere of ministry by hearing what the Spirit is saying to the churches and by setting things in order according to the advancement of the kingdom of God. This is not a comprehensive definition, but this gives you an idea of what an apostle does. They are going to reset the foundation back to its original status biblically. So they are going to bring radical change and radical shaking. And they are going to reset that foundation right before our eyes. And no matter what religion says, no matter what the preacher says, no matter what the leader says, in the end, God is going to have his way and he's going to reset this church according, when I say the church, I'm talking about the big C, <laughs> church at large, not about a particular church and not about a particular ministry. This is about what the apostle does. Let's go to the next one, if you would, Michael, for me. Hallelujah. There's the title itself, Apostle. For a long time, the only way we could relate it was if we saw a missionary, we would say that was an apostle. And most apostolic leaders will have a missionary heart, whether it's for domestic missions or foreign missions. But what they are is sent ones. In the original Roman and Greek culture, uh, like the, with the Romans, when they went in and took a land and the, the army defeated them, then the king or the queen would release an apostolic team that would go in, that would, an apostle and a team that would go in, and they would change the culture of that country. The army went in and conquered the country. But that was just a, a conquered people with the same culture, but the culture had been brought down to nothing. So now the king of the queen launches out this apostolic team to change the culture. That's what he's trying to do with us right now. Right? We are going to win a great battle. All right? this, the, the, the verdict is already in. We're going to win a great battle. But the apostolic church is going to actually be launched out and change to the king's culture, to the culture of the kingdom. Huh? It's not going to be about the Italian culture, and I like my pasta. 
Huh? It's not going to be about the American culture. It's not going to be about the Western church because we got this Western mindset that before you know it, we try to figure out Jesus thinking like a, an American. And we almost would try to, if we could, make the kingdom government, if the kingdom is anything, it's a form of government. Okay? When you say, what is the kingdom? It's, a, it's one of the forms of government. Okay? We would like the kingdom form of government to be a democracy because we're Americans, thinking that's the greatest form of government. But that has nothing to do with the government of the kingdom. In the government of the kingdom, the king rules. Right? And the other people are ambassadors, the leaders, the apostles, the prophets, the future evangelists, and all the people are ambassadors that represent the king. The king's view, the king's vision, the king's culture, and begin to change the culture of that land to a kingdom culture. Whether you go to Africa, whether you do it in South America, whether you do it in Pensacola, that's what we're called to do is to be ambassadors of the king and what the king decrees. And he gave us a whole book with all his decrees. It's real simple. You don't need to go make up some new ideas and new concepts. What you really got to do is you got to do it the right way and go back to, to what it stands for. It, you know, that looks like an apostle is a sent one or an ambassador. And he usually launches out a team to subdue and to transform the culture into kingdom culture, the culture of the king. That's one of the ways that you'll know that they're apostles, is that you're going to see them bring legitimate change. What did they do? Let's turn to number nine slide. It says, Jesus said, recognize that tree by the fruit it bears. Well, apostles, first and foremost, are going to birth and build. That's the anointing that's on their lives. They're going to birth something new, and they're going to build. An apostolic leader in business is going to birth things in business and build them systematically, strategically, according to the revelation that God gave that individual. You're going to birth businesses. They're going to birth ministries. They're going to birth churches. They're going to birth uh, uh, mission bases. Hello? That, that's what they do, right? So when you see that birthing process, you know then that the apostolic anointing, the apostolic mantle is at work. It doesn't mean that the apostle was anything special. That's the mantle that's on their life. You still have to judge in your own mind whether or not, that just because you got the mantle of the prophet and, and you're prophetic or you have the mantle of an apostle and, and, and you're apostolic and you're birthed in the building, that don't mean you're living right for God. Hello? Hello? Or that you're some super spiritual. That has nothing to do with that. The first time I started looking at it, nobody told me anything about it, but I saw all this supernatural stuff happening. Before you know it, I think, wow, they must be like really holy. They must be like really special. Guess what? They're just like me and you. Hello? We're just all serving God with fear and trembling. We're all trying to do our part and bring the gift of God to the table. Each one bringing something different. Each one putting our gift on the table, putting our gift on the altar, looking for that corporate and kingdom expansion and growth. So we, we have to recognize what it's like. What else? How else would I recognize an apostle? They govern. You're going to know they have the authority to govern. Um, I even, I, and, you know, I, I appreciate the fact right now that the President of the United States, uh, I, I appreciate him for who he is, right? I, I don't appreciate some of the things he says or does, and I, I'm not judging what he says or does, but I am so thankful right now that he's pressing forward about the things of God and the kingdom and blessing the kingdom of God, and he's representing God and representing us. There's a great openness that's happening. As the king goes in that direction, so will the rest of us. So America is fixing to get blessed. I love the fact that he's recognizing and blessing Israel. Because if you bless Israel, you're going to get blessed. America's fixing to get a blessing. Right, and right now, it, no matter what he does, America is going to get blessed because we're blessing Israel. That blessing is going to come back on us. Amen? And, and he's making choices and decisions that are very difficult. He is fighting a, a very liberal group of people who are trying to bring one world order. God wants one world order. 
his order, yes, his way, his kingdom, not man's. All right? So I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for him. Again, that doesn't mean he's holy or, or anything like that, but it says he has an apostolic anointing in this season. Hello? Like Cyrus, right? You, you know, he, he may not be a particularly godly man, you know, but boy, is he bringing a great blessing to us. And, uh, and like Jehu, huh? Jehu was another one. If you look at Jehu, when he began, Jehu began to attack and, 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 and uh, Jezebel and Ahab and all of that. And when he, once he was announced to be the king, he's coming into town. And I mean, he's riding in that chariot. And, and the description that they used to describe Jehu, yes. that reckless abandonment, that's the same terms and adjectives that they used to describe Donald Trump. So we're seeing that paradigm being fulfilled in our generation. So thank God for that. Forget about whether he's Republican, Democrat. That's a, that doesn't matter uh, what, what affiliation they are. It even don't matter really who's in the White House. It matters who's in the throne. And Jesus is in the throne. And this, this brother seems to be pushing God's ticket and program in our generation. So what are they going to do? They're going to govern. What else are they going to be spiritual parents? You're going to see parenting, when, as the apostolic begins to manifest, it's going to look very, very different. We, we, you know, we look at a pastor, and we see a pastor's heart and the heart of the shepherd, and we see the father's heart that's in the pastor. In the apostolic anointing, there, there's still spiritual parenting, but in the father's heart, it's a little bit stronger and a little bit different. It's not so much healing your wounds and your problems and your situations. It's more of the general directing the army. I love what John Kelly said, who leads the largest group of apostolic leaders in the world, uh, which is the International Coalition of Apostolic Leaders. And he says that he's made a lot of mistakes over the years. How many of you have made some mistakes and you had to do it over again? And he says, apostolically, and he was part of the original birthing team of the apostolic community, along with C. Peter Wagner and so many others. But he said that over the years, he made his mistakes when he acted like a general and should have acted like a father. And when he acted like a father, when he should have acted like a general. You know, we have to have the wisdom to know when we're leading the army of God and when we're leading the family of God, and we need to be able to know how to have that parental anointing on us. Because the tricky thing, as the church is being put back together properly, is that he's going to raise up the army of God in the same community where he restores the family of God. So there's these two different conflicting things that are going on, and we need the balance of both. This month coming up, every Wednesday night, we're going to be doing, uh, we're blessed to have Mama Hugs to be part of our fellowship here, and having had such an impact on inner healing, not just for the region, but from you know, all over the nation and other places. But every Wednesday night, she's going to be doing a solutions boot camp for five weeks. Going to be real powerful. If we need anything, we need healing. And that anointing is, is also apostolic and parental, but it's more the Father's heart and the expression of that. We need that expression, but we also need the general, right? Pointing direction, leading the army, and the tricky part is that it's going to happen all right together. But you'll know uh, because they'll have that spiritual parental type thing, trying to restore the family of God and the army of God. If we go to the next one, uh, there are fathers and mothers who sometimes gently nurture spiritual children, and other times they're in the midst of spiritual warfare and spiritual battle. When you talk about the apostolic ministry, it's a warfare ministry, and we are in the days of war and war and roses. There's a war that's going on between good and evil. And you're going to hear them talk about things 
uh, in the apostolic, as it begins to flow out there, you're going to hear him talk about spiritual warfare and the spiritual things that are facing us. You're going to hear him talk about Jezebelic spirits. You're going to talk about deliverance. You're going to talk about inner healing. They're going to talk about intercession. They're going to talk about doing battle on the wall and what spirits are opposing your family, your region, your nation. There are five major spirits right now that are, that are opposing the end time church, like Leviathan that he talks about in Job you know, 41 talks about it in Isaiah. And he said he's going to put a hook in the nose of Leviathan and he's going to capture him in this end time. Well, the spirit of Leviathan is a ruling spirit over places like Nashville and Hollywood and Washington. You know, uh, it, it is a, a ruling spirit that uh, breeds about human success and education and, and, and honors the mind rather than the spiritual things of God. So, you know, you, 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 we're going to have to fight Leviathan. And, and it, it's rooted in all kinds of pride and it changing our society in these different places. Usually the fight occurs in the gates, whether it's the spiritual gates of entertainment, the spiritual gates of education, the spiritual gates of government. That's where the fight is. And Leviathan is one of the ruling spirits. And Jezebel is certainly a ruling spirit that is going to oppose the prophetic and the apostolic in our generation. I want you to know that Jezebel spirit, it, it, it doesn't have to do anything with gender. It doesn't have to do with, with, with women. It has nothing at all to do with women. It's a spirit. It has no gender. What it is, is a spirit that tries to take God-given authority, given to someone else, and take it over. If there's an emptiness and a void left by an, a, uh, a habit spirit, Jezebel will go in and try to take that authority that actually belongs to the one that God sent. All right? And don't think that we're immune from it. Right? Wherever I go prophetically, that's one of the spirits that always fights me, right? Just as surely as it fought the prophets of old, it'll fight the prophets of today. And so that they'll try to upsurge that authority that they have and change the direction. See, she was, Jezebella was, uh, was not the one that was given the authority, but her husband Ahab was actually the king, but she ran the country. And she was also very prophetic. Hello? She had the prophets of Baal. It's a religious spirit that has the, the prophets preach and prophesy what the people want to hear and what the leaders want to hear. So and we're not immune from it. We can all be attacked by it. We have to be aware of it. When I say attacked by it, if I'm not careful, I can walk in that myself. Hello? Any one of us can. Right? Because the things that we fight are the things that are fighting us and opposing us. You have to stand in your place. If you know who you are and what you're called to do, you have to stand in your place because the enemy is always going to try to charge something or someone and upsurge that authority and take the direction in the way that God's a different way than God's trying to tell you. So you have to stand in your place. You know your place of authority. You know who you are. Stand in your place. And, and just God's going to move on your behalf, even in difficult situations. Apostolic leaders are visionaries. They're strategists. You can turn to that one. I guess that's number 12. Um, sometimes people say, and, and, and they'll describe me, two ways that they describe me that I actually never want to be described that way. Sometimes when I was in business, they would say that he's a self-made man. I don't want to hear that. I'm not trying to be a self-made man. I want to be a God-made man. I don't want to be a self-made man, right? That's the world system, right? I want to be a God-made man. So when you say to me, oh, he's a self-made man, I don't like that description, okay? The other thing, they'll try to say he's a dreamer because God ministers to me and through me through dreams and visions. But you know, all men and all women dream dreams, right? And, and, but some men and women wake up and make their dreams become a reality. They're not dreamers, they're visionaries. And that's what I want to be, is to be a visionary that wakes up from that dream and brings his life into alignment with that dream and does what's necessary to bring that to fruition. No matter what the opposition, no matter what 
This is, I'm faced with. I want to just get into alignment with the vision that God gave me and continue to move along that prophetic edge. Uh, the next one is apostles or master builders. They're anointed to build. They build the church. They build the kingdom. They, have, they know the difference. And the church is part of the kingdom. Don't think that God is trying to get rid of local church. He absolutely, first of all, he absolutely loves the church. He is madly in love with the church. Be careful if people come in and criticize the church. If they're from their pulpit, if you see them criticizing the church, there's something wrong, okay? Because it doesn't mean that the church is doing everything right, but you gotta be careful because he is madly in love with the church. This whole thing is about the church. He's coming back for the church. He's coming back for his bride. He loves us in spite of our condition. Amen? All right? So you don't want to be critical of his bride uh, any more than you want to be critical of his mother. Right? And sometimes we do both. Right? Uh, but the church is part of the kingdom. When, when an apostolic resource center, a kingdom work is birthed, the centerpiece of that work is meant to be a healthy local church. Meaning, when I say a healthy local church, it doesn't mean you have to have big, huge numbers. It means they have to be healthy. They have to be really saved. Hello, there's a lot of people with a church full of people that ain't even saved. Hello? Come on, let's, let's, let's speak the truth. They ain't, they ain't bearing the fruit of their repentance, right? And the last thing I want is people hanging out in my church and that they don't, they don't get saved. <laughs> so, but he says, you build the wall, you, you build the wall with lively stones, stones that have been brought back to life and born again, right? We bring other people into the church, but then the object is, is for them to become a disciple of Christ, a lively stone, and we put them on the wall in the place that they fit. Amen? But they're lively stones. So when we do that, we're going to see that the, the master builders are, are going to build that way. And, and they're going to understand church and the principles of church. They're going to understand the foundation. And they're going to understand government. They're going to preach repentance. If you go to number 15, see, we look around and we see what's happening in America. And we look at the whole world through the lens of America. And I said, well, if it's happening this way in America, America is the great leader. And we are great leaders as a society and want to take that away from us. But when you look at the apostolic movement worldwide, it is the fastest growing segment of the Church of Jesus Christ. Worldwide, South America, Central America, Africa, Asia are way more advanced than we are in an understanding of fivefold ministry and the kingdom purpose of God. First of all, their mindsets were already like that, where ours is set up completely different. So he is trying to change the way we're thinking, right? And he's trying to relay this foundation so we can begin to recognize and grow at that rapid pace that he's looking for. Uh, people say the only apostles were the ones that Jesus called. Anybody ever hear of that? No? I, you know, they said, well, it was, there was apostles then, but when them apostles died, then it's all done. They were, those folks, uh, uh, theologically, are called secessionists. They believe that the gifts of the Spirit and all of that end at the, first, at the end of the apostolic age. That's just not true. You know, he ordained apostles and prophets right now in the middle of the great battle. He's not going to take away these power giftings, nor is he going to take away the gifts of the Spirit at this time when we need him the most. Right? So he is trying to stir again the gifts of the Spirit back into the body of Christ and the leadership gifts as well. They'll try to tell you that they were the only apostles, but you know what? There were not just 12 apostles that were taught in the New Testament. There were more than 20 apostles that were mentioned in the New Testament. And sometimes they'll say a woman can't be an apostle, but in fact, the, 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 there were women apostles named in the New Testament, and that they were, that was a five-fold ministry title in the New Testament. It says in Revelation, if you look at slide 18, apostles of the Lamb. These, when he named these apostles of the Lamb, that's the way he talked about the first 12. 
and he made a distinction between them and the other apostles, okay? Because the other apostles were named. How about Paul? Paul was born out of season. He, he said that, but certainly he was an apostle. You know, was Timothy not an apostolic leader? Uh, you know, uh, he, he ran churches, there was Saul, you know, there, there, was, there was a lot of them, right? 20 that he recognized in the New Testament and spoke to them as apostles. But then if you go to Revelation 21 and 14, it says, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Right? So there's, there was apostles at that time. Then there was the apostles of the Lamb, which were the 12 that he originally selected, and their names are on the pillars when he's talking about what he's going to do and what he builds at the end. Now, there, and there are women apostles, men apostles. A woman can be anything that God calls her to be. I, I, I end my case in, in Genesis chapter 1, where he said, I made man in my image both male and female. So that means that the image of God is not just a man, right? The heart of God is not just the father's heart, but it's the mother's heart. We are all made in the image of God. And a woman can be anything God calls her to be, and a man can be anything God calls him to be. And the sooner we can break that prejudicial background of religion, the sooner we are going to recognize one of the strongest forces in the end time army today are women in ministry. Hello? And they're powerful intercessors. They're powerfully prophetic. They're very sensitive to the things of the spirit. No more than a man, no less than a man. We're all man, M-A-N, mankind. Amen? So he, we're all in his image. If you're looking for the heart of God and you're only looking for the male aspect of the Father's heart, you're missing a very important aspect of the heart of God, which is the nurturing heart of the mother. How many of you know that he has that nurturing heart? And we need that. Uh, we need to see every aspect of the heart of God. It's, 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 his heart is like a diamond and cut and shaved and all different things. So he can constantly, almost every single day, give us another look at a different aspect of his heart. But we have to be seeking and we have to have our hearts and our minds open to see the fresh revelation of God. Right now in this season prophetically, we're seeing mysteries that have been seem like they have been hidden for generations, but they're being released in this generation because of our mandate. I want you to know that the mysteries of God have not been hidden from us, but they have been hidden for us and for our children and our children's children, the word says. And he's revealing these mysteries now to prepare us, to launch us into our destiny which is a victorious church preparing and ushering in the second coming of Christ, right? And uh, so we, we have to really get a look at what's happening. I hope that tonight I was able to share some things with you that can help you identify apostolic leadership and, and, and why that's going to look so different and why you're going to see it oppose what is 21st century, 20th, 20th century church, the pastoral model that has ruled for a couple of generations. There's going to be an opposition to that because it requires something on our part as believers, as priests. Amen? It requires us to get up and answer the call of ministry that's on our lives. That's very challenging. It's much easier for us to just attend church and watch someone else minister. Huh? Now, when we get the apostolic look, it is empower the people because the people are the priests. And now we're raising up an entire army of priests and kings to change our society. This is the way the end time army is going to unfold. So I hope tonight I gave you a little different look and a feel for it because that's the way God's headed prophetically. And, and it's going to bring opposition. 
and, and when you see the opposition in your own life, you get a fresh revelation from God, there's a couple of things that are going to happen to you. First, every revelation that you get from God requires the appropriate response. Hmm? Yes, Lord, send me. I'll go. Right? It, 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 there's a response. To every revelation, we have to respond in obedience. Right? So it requires the appropriate, obedient response when you get a revelation. My flesh don't like it. Hello? My flesh likes to take it easy. My flesh wants to do it the way I've always done it. My flesh wants me to just hang right where I'm at. Us four, no more, real comfortable. Don't rock the boat. Don't shake the thing. Hello? I'm going to tell you what. Our God rocks your boat. He's rocking your boat right now. He is shaking everything that can be shaken. And that that remains will be of the kingdom. All right? He is going to rock our boat and rock our revelation of what we thought church was. And he's going to call forth out of us something that we don't even know exists in there. We look at ourselves in the mirror. The way Gideon looked at himself. I'm from the weakest tribe, and I'm the weakest one from the weakest tribe. How could I be a mighty warrior? But I want you to know, God is calling forth the mighty warrior in you, and he is going to energize you. You go in the strength that you have, and he will make up the difference. But respond in obedience uh, to God and to the revelation of the moment, and go forth. Go ye, and God will meet you there. Whether he's telling you to go to the nations, whether he's telling you to go to the city, you know, he is telling us to get up and out of that seat and out of our comfort zone and, and to realign ourselves with the fullness of the purpose of God that is challenging us in the natural realm. He's challenging me. He's going to challenge you. That's the job of the Holy Ghost. Hello? Is to confront us and confront our humanity. He doesn't bring uh, condemnation, but he brings conviction, right? Which is altogether different. But he'll bring us and he'll convict us of our willingness to stay status quo because he's wanting to bring great change. So he's going to challenge us. If you feel the challenges of God, just continue to press into God and know that he can fulfill every promise that he ever made to us. Okay. So uh, I hope tonight you saw something about the apostolic. Stretch your hands toward Jennifer here, the sister with the flowers on. Hallelujah. Sister, the, the Lord said that there's a powerful anointing on your life to administrate, to operate, to run, to manage, to lead. And all of these things are being worked out in this season. And there are some people who can't see that in you and some people who are quite threatened as you begin to come to the forefront and you are particularly going to front uh, to 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 frighten some men who are standing in a place of authority because you're going to come with an anointing that is going to change some things and even some policies as he begins to work out the fullness of this administrative call that's on your life this leadership call says the lord right behind you sister heidi hallelujah Glory to God. The Lord says, yes, you're called to children, but you're also called to adults, and you're called to lead, and you're called to speak. And the Lord says, you're called to be bold, to be bold and courageous in this hour and season. The Lord says, you've always been willing to be in the background, that you're transitioning right now into a brand new season, into a very unusual season, a very different season. You would have thought that this would be a time of taking it easy, of doing things and all this stuff. And all of a sudden, there's all this busyness that's everywhere around you. And the Lord says, no, that I've prepared you for this moment by all the things that you've gone on and done before, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bob, there's still a busy thing that's going on in your life and a lot of things still left for you to do. And travel will be a pattern in your life 
on an ongoing basis. But know that he will establish for you as well a nesting and a resting place, and he's going to bring a great balance into your life. And now I see this huge scale that looks like the, the scale of justice. And what he's going to bring into your life is a balance. That in this season, there's going to be a balance. The Lord says that your personality is that kind of personality that actually focuses, that actually looks and condenses things into this pattern and bang, till you break through. And he said, you've always had that, boom, you were 100%. When you said you were in, bang, you were 100%. And, and he said, I'm not going to take that away. He said, but I'm going to bring great balance. And he said, I want to balance every single area of your life, and you're going to find an ease as you go forward, says the Lord. The Lord says he's patterned things for you, and he gives you a way of thinking that's a very strategic patterned way of thinking. And once you do it, you can do it, and you can do it, and you can do it until you get it done continually. And this, he said this manner of thinking allows you to focus and allows you to function and allows you to produce tangible results. He said, I'm not going to take that away. He said, because that's a God-given talent that I gave you. He said, what I'm going to do is bring balance, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Uh, the sister here, uh, in the green. Yeah. Sister, the Lord's doing something very special and very specific with you right now. And, and, and the Lord says that you and your husband are going to have a very specific focus and function. And small groups is going to be a very important place for you. And I see young adults uh, around you and gathering together around you and in, in, in these small places. And these young people are going to feel very free to be able to share their heart. And you're going to be a part of what he does in this generation that we call next gen, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's not done with you yet, sister. He's got more to do. There's more things that are going to happen. He said that there's a fire that's going on in the inside. He said, you're sending up some smoke signals, and I've been hearing them. And the Lord says that part of your job and part of what you do is that you light little fires in people's hearts that think they're already on fire, and they're not. And he said, you have discernment to know who is and who is not. And he said, no. He said, I'm going to put a match in your hand, and you're going to strike the match to some people who think they have the fire, but they don't says the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Wonderful Jesus. Becky, get the trumpet because he's called you to blow the trumpet. Sound the alarm. Don't be afraid. It's going to look different, sound different, act different, smell different, but know that it's my heart. And the Lord says that the word that you bring is going to have great accuracy on it at different times. But it's not always going to be well received in certain communities. But the Lord says, know that there's a place for you and get the trumpet ready because you're going to blow the trumpet and sound the warnings of the things that are happening. And discernment is going to come your way in this season in a new and special way, says the Lord. Katie, there's an anointing on your in the house there, Katie. There you go. Katie, the Lord's called you to preach, and he's called you to teach. He's calling you now to a, a, a much deeper place spiritually. You're kind of in a transitional season. He said that your mind works very strategic. Boom, 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 boom. Mm -hmm. And you like everything orderly. You like everything in place. You like to see the way it fits. You like to see all the files go boom, 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 boom. He said, I'm turning some things over upside down in your life. He said, I'm going to show you a new way and a new thing and a new aspect of your heart as I bring you to a deep spiritual place. And part of that's going to be teaching and preaching in the body of Christ, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Wonderful Jesus. He is wonderful. You know what? We're going to pray for some folks yet tonight, and uh, I'm going to pray over you first. But tonight, you know, the, the next gen been on my heart a little bit. And uh, how about you? You, you? you like? You know, sometimes we see this next generation, and we're kind of like, eh, you know. <laughs> we hear their music. Mm, we see them doing this here, and uh-oh, you know. That would be uncomfortable, eh? 
but God is doing something amazing in them. I, I was just with the International Young Prophets, and when I heard their heart, man, my heart jumped. I'm thinking, my goodness, Jesus, what are you doing with this generation? You know, so tonight, and usually and, and when we have our, our glory encounter nights, you know, we want to pray for everybody, and we pray a little bit prophetically now. But I want to get some next-gen people up here to pray for you. You know, a lot of times we're praying for, how many of you have been praying for them? Huh? You've been praying for that next generation to come, right? Well, the next gen is here, right? So uh, uh, tonight I'd like to get Dr. Rob to come up and Katie to come up. And uh, I know that Michael and Christina can't always come together, but if one of the two of you can bust free back there, you come on up. Hallelujah. Uh, Joshua and uh, the two Joshuas and your wife, you come pray together as a team, husband and wife, if you would. Right? And you know, let's just come up to this next gen and let's let them pray. But by the way, they're very prophetic. The people that I called up, they're, gonna, they're probably going to have a word for you. Open up your heart now. Yeah. God speaks to these guys and the prophetic flow that's in the house and the anointing that's that, that the mantle that's in the house is really falling on them. I don't know if you heard them lately prophesy but there's something just absolutely wonderful. So I'm going to get a little prayer and why don't you get a little prayer. Before you come up, I just want to pray over you right now. And we're going to be here again next Sunday morning and then the glory service at night but there will be no Sunday night on Mother's Day. Okay, that we had the mamas stay home and, and, and you let the papas cook. Oh, oh Richard. No, Richard. No, -uh. he said, he ain't buying into that. No. <laughs> we get some of this next gen come on up here and, and they're going to pray for us tonight. And Father, let your hand of blessing, let your hand of favor. Rest upon your people. Father, bless them physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially. Father, give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you're doing in the church, in our generation. Let us see. Let us hear. Let us know. Let us declare. Let us decree. Father, before you change this whole world, change me. Change me, Lord. Change us that we may be changed continually into your likeness, that we may manifest your will in the earth. Father, bless them in every single way. Let the blessings and the covenant blessings of Abraham just overtake them now. Bless them financially. Let those blessings rain down. Bless their businesses. Bless their homes. Bless their families. Bless them physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially. I declare amazing prosperity blessings to just rule and reign in their lives and relational blessings to come to pass. Father, that they will bring reconciliation and restoration right now in their families, in their homes, in their workplace. In the name of the Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you now, and you feel free to come up and up and get some prayer. God bless you, and we're going to see a whole lot more of you. If you're signed up for solutions, meet right over here. Mama Hug will give you the slip of paper and give you your booklet as well. Okay, so if you're signed up for solutions, that's every Wednesday night. Go ahead and fill out this piece of paper for Mama and she'll give you your book for your homework for week one.